For the longest time, I thought that creating professional materials was something you could only do inside of Cycles. But it actually turns out that you can get equally amazing results in Eevee. So with some new knowledge I recently picked up in a Blender course, I now know everything to teach you how to take your Eevee shading skills to the next level. So let's start off by creating a smart material for this shader ball here. And as a little side note, this is a fully procedural material, which means that it works on any object. However, just to make it easier for you guys, you can download this exact shader ball down in the description below. So here's an overview of what we'll create in this video. And let's start off by creating our edge mask. Now I recorded this once before and it was a really, really long video. I don't want to waste your time going over at this, at that. So these are all the nodes you're going to need to create this edge mask. And instead, I want to focus on connecting them up and showing you what each individual node does. I'm assuming your node system is going to look something like this because I just showed you it should look like that. Um, but before we can continue, here's my one biggest tip for doing materials in Blender. Enable Node Wrangler in the add-ons and preview any node you are currently working on. You can do this by Control shift clicking on the node, which will preview it for you, which is usually more visually telling than previewing the entire shader. And as an added bonus, it also helps you grasp the concept of how values affect a roughness or metallic shader. So let's preview the ambient occlusion node and nothing. That's because the ambient occlusion functionality is not something that works by default in Eevee. It does in cycles, but since Eevee doesn't have ray tracing, you'll have to enable the option in render properties. Ambient occlusion is actually the key to creating these assets. And so I feel it's important to explain what it does. Normally, ambient occlusion captures the amount of ambient light a certain part of a mesh is exposed to. This creates shadowing in logical places such as crevices and between touching objects. And it does this by looking at which shapes of an object are concave. But the AO node in Blender also has the option to set it to inside instead. Meaning that it's now no longer looking at concave shapes, but instead looking at convex shapes. By having it set to inside, this will provide the basis to our edge mask. Let's also enable local only, which will make sure that the other objects in our scene don't affect the AO of this object. The sample value is also important here since 16 is a bit of an overkill. 8 works equally well and also makes rendering it a bit faster, so that's a win-win in my book. I've set the distance to a really low number like 0.05 since this value is now effectively the size of the edge mask. By connecting this to the invert node, the colors get flipped. Why? Well, because as far as masks go, white means show and black means hide. So if you want to expose worn edges, we'll need to show show them. And this means that the edges should be white in our mask. Now this looks okay, but we need a bit more variation and control. So let's set these up by setting the mix color to multiply and connecting them like this. The mix color node is now multiplying all the values from our ambient occlusion with the values from the map range, which means that all black parts equal to zero from the noise texture affect the AO and mask those parts out. If we now change the noise texture values and use the map range to crunch in those values a bit, we can change the way our edge mask breaks up. Here are the values I used in the final render. The final step is connecting the multiply to the math node and setting that to greater than. This now mathematically removes any value greater than the threshold specified. So by setting this to a low value like 0.1 for example, we can really crunch in the values for a sharper mask result. Let's move on to our next very important mask for professional materials. The Ambient Occlusion Mask. So here's the nodes for this mask and before previewing the final result, let's connect them up like this. From left to right, here's what each node does. The noise texture is again used to create variation and detail for the AO mask. By changing the detail, skill and roughness, this node provides a lot of different values which are plugged into the distance socket on the AO node. This breaks up the distance values and therefore the ambient occlusion, making it nice and grungy. The AO node just needs one change, again enabling local only, just to make sure that the other objects don't affect this AO mask. The last two nodes share a similar function. 
The color ramp first can be used to increase the amount of black values in the mask or white and I'm using it to crunch in the whites and get a more defined mask shape. Similarly, the map range increases the contrast even more and makes the white values stronger while at the same time being able to flip the colors. So that's why I use a map range opposed to, for example, an invert node. Here are the final values I used. Now this leaves us with one final procedural mask for added detail. A scratch mask because what doesn't look realer with a few scratches on it right now it might not seem like it but this mask actually requires the most nodes to set up but don't worry it's simple enough once more here are the nodes you'll need to create this mask and this is how to connect each individual node together i'll start with the core of this mask the voronoi textures by default, they output these spherical gradients on your mesh and to keep these consistent, we need them to use the right texture coordinate. By default, Blender uses generated coordinates and instead I want to use object coordinates. So with the mapping node and the texture coordinate node, let's combine those together and make sure we are using object texture coordinates. Now this top one here should generate lines instead of spheres. So instead of using the F1 type, use distance to edge. To make sure these become very thin wide lines, we use the math node. Set it to less than and similarly to the greater than we used before, it'll remove every everything below the set threshold from the texture. By setting it to a really low value like 0.01, you get thin white lines. This threshold value is now essentially the thickness of your scratches. This is where the second Voronoi texture comes into play. By using the map range to flip the colors, essentially flipping the two min and two max values, we can now use the from max value to determine how much of the lines should be masked out. To actually mask it out, set the math node to multiply and multiply the second Voronoi over the first. Again, multiplying black values over white values, masking out certain parts. And since the second Voronoi is still set to the F1 type, we are now getting these black spheres shapes which are perfect for masking out the lines to create our scratch shapes. Now it's quite important to keep the skills between the two Voronoi textures similar and that's why I like to use a value node and just plug that in to both the skill values on the Voronoi textures just to ensure they are always the same. Now this map is good enough by its own but I want to make it a little better still. So I'm going to randomize and smooth out the scratch shapes for a realer look. We can do this by taking another texture like for example the Musgrave texture and plugging that into the location input for the mapping node. This will generate vectors which will change the shape of the Voronoi texture adding randomization and curvature to the lines. The final thing this mask needs is a bit stronger contrast. So here's a little test to see if you've picked up something so far. Which node do you need to add at the end of our node system here to make sure that the white values pop yet the black values stay exactly the same? Did you answer multiply? Nice going. Indeed, the multiply will do just that. I have now changed this range of values to go from 0 to 10, making sure that all the values that are not 0 are now 10 times stronger. Here are the final values I used for the scratch mask. So we now have three amazing procedural masks. Using them though might not be immediately obvious, so let's dive into that and create a professional material using our newly created smart masks. But before we do that, I mentioned not that long ago that until recently I thought doing this stuff was practically impossible inside of Eevee, which goes to show you're never done learning new things. There's always someone who knows something you don't. And in this case, this was Louis Dumont who has taught me how to do this in CG Boost's latest course, Robotic Planet. I had so much fun doing it and I learned a ton of new things from Louis, like concept sketching and blender and rigging for robots, using decals, Eevee shading techniques, animation and all of it resulted in this cute little robot I made. It truly is a great course for beginners and more advanced Blender users alike. To celebrate, CG Boost is now giving away an amazing scene to showcase your work for free when you buy the course. This offer lasts until August 16th, so make sure to get it while you can. You can find the link in the description. When creating materials, it's usually advised to start with either the displacement or roughness since these are crucial in getting it to look right. However, I'm stubborn and I like doing things my own way, so I begin with the base color. What? 
Well, because it's visually the easiest to see what adding a certain mask or color does and then work my way down the principled BSDF. Most of these maps rely heavily on mixing colors or values. There's a note for that called the mix color note. FYI, these used to be called mix RGB if you were using a version before 3.4 or mix if you're using 3.5 or 3.6, but you have to set it to color mix instead or mix in 3.6 or color mix in 3.6. But there's also no call combined color, which feels similar. You still paying attention? Yeah. Me neither. Just download Blender 3.6 and you're good to go. So let's take a mixed color node and choose two colors. The top one will be the object's main color and the bottom one a darker dirt version of the color. I'm going with a nice blue and a darker more maybe brownish blue as well. If we now preview this mixed color node by control shift clicking it, it's going to give you exactly that, a mix between the two colors. The factor here decides which color is being shown on the model, so we need a mask to drive this and make sure the entire thing isn't one or the other but a combination of the two. Let's use the AO1 to do just that. Easy, right? So I want to have exposed edges of bare metal and bare metal for the scratches too. This bare metal should be a light grayish color, I think, and combined with the previous color output from our AO color mix. So let's duplicate this node with Shift D, plug in the AO color in socket A, change the color for B to a light gray tone, and again, preview the output. Okay, so that's working. It's now mixing the colors again, and we just need to give it a mask input in the fact to specify which color goes where. In this case, I want both the edge wear and scratches to be a similar color. So let's take those two masks and combine them. Now you could do this using another mixed color node, but without getting all technical, mixed color nodes are harder to compute in the final shader than for example, math nodes. So if you can, try using math nodes. And since in this case, we're only working with black and white values, we can perfectly find use math nodes to do just that. So add a math node, set it to add, actually set to add by default and combine the two masks. As you can see, this gives us a perfect mix of the two masks. Now it's just a matter of plugging this newly combined mask into the second mix colors factor and voila, all colors are now properly combined. Here's how that looks so far. I think the basics are there, but we'll need more maps like metallic roughness and the normal map to really make it look great. Luckily, we have everything set up now to realize those even faster. Now a metal object needs to look metallic, right? So let's set the metallic value for our shader to one, which sort of works, but also makes the paint metallic. Now that looks pretty cool, maybe for a car or something, but I want a more regular painted metal object like this one in my reference here. Now let's use the masks again to tell Blender what's metallic and what's not. And like I said, we can do this even faster since we already have the map we need right here. The scratch and edge wear mask combination. By simply inputting this mask directly into the metallic value of the principled BSTF, it works and makes all exposed parts metal whilst retaining a non-metallic look for the rest of it. Now onto the last two maps, roughness and normal. Now for the roughness, it makes sense that our object has an overall roughness value and a separate one for the dirt, which should be rougher and another separate one for the metallic part. And to do that, we'll need a mixed color node and one color ramp. Now here's my biggest tip for roughness maps. Nothing is ever 100% reflective or 100% rough. So don't use black and white for this color ramp, but instead use values that are more in the middle space. So for the black value, use something like a mid gray and for the white value, go light gray. This will result in more natural looking materials. Pro tip. So let's take the color ramp and plug that into the mix color node A. The B socket in this case will be the roughness for our bare metal. Now logically the mask we'll need again is the combined edge wear and scratch mask. Plug that into the factor and finally let's take the mix color into the principal roughness value. Now that looks pretty dang good, right? Anyways, roughness done. The normal map will be the final layer of detail to make this material pop. And for it to do that, I want it to have a nice general bump. Super simple, you've probably done it yourself before. Add a noise texture, set the scale to something like 200 or 300, whatever works for your object basically. Detail and roughness down to zero and plug that into the height socket of a bump node and finally into the normal socket on the principled BSDF. Usually the default strength of the bump node is way too strong, so tune that down to make sure it's more subtle. And voila, there you have it, general bump for your object. Normal, done. Nope.
Not done yet because this also added the bump to all the exposed metal and the scratches for example and that's no bueno. So we'll need to mask this off again and since the bump node takes in height data that means we can use black and white values to do that once more. So let's add a mixed color between the noise texture and bump and first make sure the edgeware has no bump. No bump means no height meaning black so by plugging the edge mask into the factor and setting the B color to black we've done just that. Black edgeware resulting in no bump. Now let's add in the scratches which should be visible even on the bare metal meaning they need to be white. So repeat as before. Take a mix color, plug in the scratch mask as the factor, take the edgeware color into A and set the B color to be white. A cool tip here is that if you want the scratches to be more visible you can actually increase white values above their one threshold. So by changing the value to be 10 for example we've now made the scratches 10 times more visible in the bump node. Having done that we now get exactly what we want. The noise bump visible in different gray values, black for the bare metal edges and white for the deeper scratches. Plug that into the height again, just enable invert on the bump node to make sure the scratches actually cut into the material and not lay on top of the material and the normal map is now all done. So that wraps up all of our maps and the material is now completely done. If you want to see the full node overview, I've uploaded an image online which you can check out with the link in the description. Now you might remember me calling this a smart material. This is what I like to call it because it adapts itself to any geometry you use it on whilst maintaining full control over all parameters. It even works when making real-time changes to your mesh. And so that's how you create a fully procedural smart material inside of Eevee, which as I mentioned in the beginning is just about as easy as doing it in Cycles. But if you're going for the most realistic result possible, Cycles is the only way to go. So check out this video where I'll show you how to create similar procedural masks and a professional material in Cycles.